Every athlete is a unique package of talent and will and courage and open-mindedness. Like it seemed like every time she stepped on the track, there was a record that was falling, um, some big surprise. She might be a once in a career talent. Jenny has like the best last 50 in the world. When she sees it, when it's in reach and she sees it, she yeah, she really, she's pretty fearless. If she feels right at 300 meters to go, she becomes like a barracuda. She threw the plan out the window and said, psycho time. I don't want anyone to ever think that what I do is easy or that it doesn't require a dose of courage. Even if you know that you're doing the thing that you're best at, it's always a risk to show people and say, this is, this is my best today. Oh, you're back in uh, the University of Colorado's indoor practice facility. I think you're here to watch Jenny Simpson do a boring workout. So today is what we call a lactate threshold run, what other people call a tempo run. She'll be balancing an assigned pace and an assigned heart rate. This is a high level, uh, minimal lactate run really productive as far as we're concerned one of our most productive workouts just not real sexy to watch so are you all right i'm great i'm great closer to 62. Uh, shoot for 62 your first lap or two okay okay first lap or two 62 and then i'll just listen to you mm -hmm. and, yeah, and, and you just do what you're told <laughs> if you're keeping track of me the only thing is that like deep into it yeah. i might lose track of my no problem so yeah uh, just yeah. uh I'll yeah. ask you. If I ask we'll you, we'll probably move around in the miles. Yeah, the okay, that's so fine. So that you're, if you tell me, you have a better idea. Yeah, we'll get to over there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right. Heather, do you have Jenny? Okay. Heather, you got Jenny? Okay. I'm with you. Okay, ready? The story of me beginning my journey in running is really important to me, especially I think as I get older, um, because I take it less for granted. In third grade, we moved from Missouri to Florida um, over our Thanksgiving break. I remember that my elementary school PE teacher, Mr. White, uh, suggested that um, I go out for the after school program, which was a little cross country group, just to make friends. Lawton Elementary School put on a mile race at the end of the year. I don't remember what I ran, but I do remember that I was second. And I always like <laughs> think that that has been like the most important race of my life because getting second was just so close to the prize that I had to keep going and try and win the next year. I got like barely outleaned by Brittany Baxter and uh, that has motivated me for decades. <laughs> the revenge of that first mile. Um, I went through, my, my watch worked. It didn't do the auto split, so I went through a half split today if you guys want to. Although you guys probably have the overall time in the hall. need the overall time in the hall. That's a week. Way, this is way better. That's the thing is you can become addicted to showing off to yourself or beating yourself from three weeks ago and you spoil the work. So, yeah. I'd rather be, I would rather that we even went slower and if we stuck to the heart rate sign. My first impression of Coach Wetmore was that he looked terrifying because I was at Foot Locker South Regionals. I remember being really cold that day and he had kind of a long trench coat and everybody knows, you know, Wetmore has a ponytail and, um, and he isn't like a smiley person. So <laughs> I just remember him coming like down the course, like walking across the course and thinking like, I don't know if I can talk to that person. But again, like, you know, you need him and very, very friendly. Um, but yeah, him approaching you like with his ponytail and a trench coat was a little intimidating the first time I ever met him. Yeah, it's pretty cold out, but we'll go outside and cool down. What do you need? It's torture after all these laps to do more inside. Nah. You got buffalo skin. <laughs> 
like, oh, it's just gonna be like 15 minutes and it'll be over. Oh, oh like, see, when I sit, when I think that one, I'm like, it's gonna be 15 minutes and so I'll wear as much as possible. <laughs> Have your own elevator. It feels like they need to update the decor. <laughs> it's been a really long time since I was in college and that was put up. But it's funny, you can take a ride with Jenny any day at CU. <laughs> The only one in I came into the University of Colorado thinking, I really want to be a great 5K runner. And I think Mark thought that too. I think he thought I had what it took to be a really great 5K runner. And so my freshman year kind of tells a lot of the story. We started with uh, the steeplechase. Yes, she didn't know what the steeplechase was. She'd never seen one. We had to walk her through and say, here are the people that are in the 1500, here are the people that are in the 5000. If you'd like to make it to the NCAA finals, there's this event where you jump over stuff and there's some water involved. Why not? We should stick her in a steeplechase and see how she does. And I had a couple of practices. She wasn't immediately great at the steeplechase. She took, she had a learning curve. And the first time I ever went over a water jump, I supermaned into the track, got like, like track burn all down my body. And I remember being in the locker room um, in, in Carlson gym and calling my high school coach and saying, I'm going to run the steeplechase at a meet this weekend. And he's like, that is a terrible idea. <laughs> But you're not an athletic person. Like you're a fit person, you're good at running, uh, but hand-eye coordination was never like uh, something I was known for. The final of nationals was the first time that I really went out and just tried to run as hard as I could. I'm guessing that I was thinking, well, second as a freshman is pretty good. I knew the whole last 400 meters, I thought, I'm gonna win. I can't believe this. I'm a freshman in college and I'm gonna win. And I really enjoyed the last lap, like really knowing that and believing that and thinking that. I was willing to do the steeple if I got to win stuff. So after winning, I was like, all right, I can do the steeple for a while. <laughs> of all the really wonderful experiences I've had um, and all the international trips I've been on, looking back, I think the World Championships in Osaka was one of the hardest for me. And it's just a completely different stage. This is not juniors anymore. This isn't college anymore. This is people that are fighting for medals and fighting for their careers. I was a sophomore in college. And so, you know, there's agents around and there's meet directors and there's all this stuff going on. And it was just um, a level of competition that I hadn't experienced before. I mean, we, we had no plans to run the USA Championships and thus no plans to try and make the world team. But at the NCAA Championships, in the first lap, her shoe got stepped on. And she had to stop and put it back on and she lost 15 or 20 seconds and she lost the race. And we just said, let's not end with that feeling of disappointment. And so let's just go to the USA's and see what you can do. And she won it. And we had to have a, a group meeting, Mark and Jenny and I, and decide if we were even gonna go to the Worlds. And I didn't make the final. And I ran, I did not run well. It wasn't her fitness in Osaka, it was just, she was totally intimidated. And I, I don't think without the, the disappointment or the, the failure to advance in Osaka that she makes the Olympic final and breaks the American record. That's another aspect of, of a successful person's personality is that anything less than their best is a disappointment. If, if the first team I ever made was the Olympic Games in 2008, it would have been really unfortunate to be overwhelmed and out of my depth that year. Some people are happy to go and they finish and they say, well, I was just happy to have been here. I think a very successful person can't be satisfied with just getting the USA sweatshirt and having the trip. So we're in the kitchen and uh, today is a perfect example of a really typical normal weekday. I did a workout in the morning, I came home, did a couple of errands, um, took a little nap <laughs> and uh, lifted, did a second run and it's six o'clock and I'm gonna get dinner ready um, before Jason comes home. Tonight I'm gonna do just roasted root vegetables and I'm gonna use the beet greens and make a salad out of them. That'll be really yummy. And uh, we're gonna make some steak. So I cook um, our dinner meal probably six nights a week. Um, one night a week we'll go out and, um, and eat out somewhere. Um, we recently have, oh, 
don't show that. <laughs> but one of the reasons that I have been really intentional about cooking um, over the last few years is that first of all, I'm a professional. I have the time and the luxury to be able to be home and do a lot of the cooking. Um, but then you know everything that's going into your body. And I think that's a really important part of just engaging with um, how your body is operating and recovering. I'm gonna make sure you have a good grass-fed cut of meat. Oh, that looks nice. What am I seeing? <laughs> I'm a, I see a huge hunk of meat that's protein and iron. That's gonna be in my stomach in about 30 minutes. So we're gonna take it and just put the pan directly into the heated oven. I'm probably not the best at making super fancy meals, but as a hungry runner, I'm really good at getting good meals on the table in 30 minutes. Sometimes you just have to have things that make you happy. This is the only mouse I ever want in my kitchen. And like, honestly, I feel kind of proud of this because this is truly, truly our normal life. Like what you guys saw tonight. This is very- <laughs> This is a real evening. Very typical for a Simpson, Simpson family dinner. Cheers, water. Chat and- Sure. Cool. I'm spoiled because now that this is all done, Jason will go in the kitchen and do all the dishes. So I feel like it's a good, it's a fair trade. And mm -hmm. I never feel guilty just sitting down and letting him do it. It's a little it. bit of both. I take, I take instructions well. And so there's, there's certain dishes that have to be hand washed and then certain that have to be loaded in a certain way. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not, as, uh, not as easy as it sounds. But you got it. Yeah. <laughs> I had moved to, to Boulder after I graduated from a school in Missouri. Um, and I think that was, that was a summer of, their spring summer of 2008. And so it was kind of a, a really neat um, time to, to meet and, and start dating because um, she made her first Olympic team that July. And so a lot of our getting to know each other um, happened through emails and letters um, while she was overseas racing and then of course racing in, in Beijing. <laughs> I was hesitant to believe that I would make the team to the extent that I had an internship that summer with um, a congressman. Like I had to go to him in the middle of my internship and say, uh, <laughs> last weekend I made the Olympics. You know, especially because she was in Beijing, that's 13 hours ahead of Colorado time or something like that. And so while I was working really hard and running and, and working two jobs and she was in Beijing, a lot of our conversations either by email or by Skype. The Skype calls, because of the time zone difference, would be like at 6 a.m. or at midnight or something like that. I, I'm, I'm grateful that the first time I made the games, it got to be all about just the Olympic experience. But I didn't have the pressure that a lot of the most elite athletes do of this is your moment to like solidify the significance of your whole career. Just really take in and absorb and enjoy the Olympic experience. And so 2008 will always be the most Olympic for me. 2009 was really special. It, was like, it seemed like every time she stepped on the track, there was a record that was falling or a personal best that was happening. I think back and I think if, if there's a year that you can just say, Everything was just running on all cylinders. Wetmore really wanted me to have the opportunity to set as many kind of school records before I graduated. So we needed the 1500. So we saw this opportunity that maybe I could run the 1500 meters. The Prefontaine Classic before Nationals. All I need to do is just hold on for dear life and I'll run 406. Of all races in my career, that is the race that changed my life. And I remember being in the race and like waiting and waiting, and waiting for them to all run away from me. And realizing that like no one was really running away from me. And thinking, well, I'll move up a little bit. I was near the water jump and she went by with 200 to go and I said, she, I said to myself, she can break four minutes. And I remember screaming it to her, but I I'm sure she didn't hear me. Everyone can say that they were shocked at the Prefontaine Classic in 2009 but nobody was more shocked than I was. 
We were hoping she'd run 402 or 403. We were confident her fitness level was there. I could not believe it. I couldn't believe that being challenged at that level, I was able to rise to a sub four race. It like blew my mind. And I like went up to her after and was like, you're so amazing. And she was like, who are you? <laughs> That just catapulted me into this whole other level of understanding. I'm not gonna just try and be a great collegiate for the Colorado Buffaloes. I just did something that only a few people are ever gonna do. I had the opportunity to, to graduate from school. I was done academic, I could have been done academically, but I really wanted to come back and, and run my final cross country season. And it just felt important to me to not leave that on the table. And so I took one more semester and, and finished and, and took a few more classes. All my races had gone pretty well and we finally get to the end to nationals. It did not go well. It was hard to be Jenny Simpson in October and November of 2009 and to be a collegian. We allowed external uh, concerns interfere with the fall of 2009. Talking to shoe companies, talking to agents, but uh, I felt it wouldn't be a distraction. I was wrong. Instead of doing what I had done all along, really understanding what I was capable of and running inside of what I was capable of, I think this was really a mistake of thinking that I had to do something you know, amazing for kind of the last, for the last race. I went out too hard. I, I think I remember we went just a little over nine minutes through the 3K mark in a 6K race for cross country. And I remember uh, approaching 3000 meters and feeling like I was really at my limit and there were still people with me. And that was really terrifying. She passed through 3K and came down the long hill and I said, she's in trouble. She's not going to win this race. I know that she's in trouble. I can see it on her face. I don't know, you know, exactly what happened. I don't remember a lot of it. I remember having, she fell in front of me two or three times and I, I had this internal battle of do I step out and get her and just stop her. And I, there are actually coaches next to me from other teams who were telling me, go out and get her, what are you doing? Why are you letting her continue? And so that, yeah, that was really hard because I'm trying to decide, am I doing the right thing here by letting her continue or is this irresponsible? And so, I mean, the question is to Jenny, did I do the right thing? And I remember feeling like, you know, the really long stretch, I think it's about 500 meters up to the, from that gate at the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill. Um, I remember really, really, really struggling for about 2,000 meters to get to that point. But I remember getting to that point with 500 meters to go and thinking, finish this with dignity. I, even in that moment, I really felt like I've had a wonderful, wonderful experience. And this doesn't have to, um, this doesn't have to go down in flames, you know? And so I really, really wanted to gather myself and run that last 500 meters really hard and without falling or making a scene or, or you know, just being dramatic. And I, I, I did that. And I look back and I think that was character in a moment that was really, really difficult, where it would have been really easy to give in. I mean, she gets up and She's way down and she kicks by like 40 people in the last 400 and she just didn't quit. And after the race, she just said, I know it was hard for my coaches and I'm so glad they didn't stop me. I tell myself that the hallmark of a bad coach is that they always pass the blame onto the athlete or to the parents or the crowd or the bus or something. Uh, I brought her back too fast from Berlin, too soon to racing. Uh, just, I have to bite the bullet and raise my hand and say, my fault. You know, you, you think about the race and people, a lot of people saw the race and s saw the meltdown. 
but that wasn't the worst part for me. The worst part was when I was on my own for months after that, running and thinking, I don't, I can't tell people. When you start panicking, you it's really hard to get yourself out of that. And the frightening thing is that for kind of a long time after that, I, I would revisit, I would kind of have that experience again. I would try to run hard and I would start having that shortness of breath, kind of that panicky feeling. And there were, there were a few moments where I kind of wondered, is, is this it? Like, am I gonna be able to run hard again, ever? And I felt very alone in that. And like, I couldn't share that with people and I couldn't tell people because I felt like there was a lot at stake. Um, and a lot of what was around me and that I knew and I was comfortable with wasn't there anymore because I, I, I wasn't at the University of Colorado and I wasn't welcome to stay with, um, with the coaches that I was with. So the people that knew me best that would have kind of been able to like share that moment and understand what I had been through kind of weren't in my life at that moment. So those were the kind of the loneliest times. And then eventually I did go talk to um, a counselor. And I feel really fortunate that the place that I ended up when I felt like I had nowhere to go was the Olympic Training Center because they had incredible resources and wonderful, wonderful people that their life is about like helping athletes and empowering and enabling athletes to be their best. I really remember being like several months later and back into racing and thinking, oh yeah, I used to be worried that I might not be able to be here again. And I don't remember what that must have felt like. Sometimes being in a dark place is part of kind of navigating those troubled waters, you know? When you come out on the other side, you just know more about yourself and you know more about what you're capable of. We didn't see her after we left the race because she went home with her family and we went home to Boulder and so we didn't see her for about a week. It was probably in about maybe January or February that we sat down with her and we just said, we're, we're going to step back, we're not going to coach you. And it was time for her to have more autonomy. So uh, she chose to go with a coach that you've heard of named Julie Benson, a competent coach. When I needed a coach, um, she was close and, and she had a lot of experience racing the 1500 meters, which was new to me. I had never done that before and it was something that I really wanted to try. And so if I was gonna not steeple and run another event, I, was, I, was, I really wanted to be great at the 1500. I think sometimes diving into the deep end of something that you don't know, that's what the 1500 meter was for me in, in 2011. It was the first time I ran a world championships that I wasn't running the steeplechase. And so everything was just new and um, a little bit untested, but with a different level of confidence. So my goal in 2011, kind of like my freshman year in the steeplechase is like, I just want to make the final. And then I have such a fond memory of the night that Julie and I traveled from the accommodations um, with the athletes to the stadium in 2011. And I remember telling her, like, I'm one of 12 people that have made the final. And so three people are going to medal. But I was like, oh, I'll just play the odds. I have 25% chance of, of doing really well if there's only 12 of us. Like, not expecting it, but believing it was possible. And then I did it. I was watching it from home, and Mark was watching it from Tegu. We both had the same thought. We were talking to each other later about the race, and we both said... With 350 to go, I said, Jenny's going to win this race. We've seen that side of her. It's the, it's the target in my crosshairs. She's a good closer. Um, yeah, while it would have been a surprise before the gun went off, the last lap said it's over. <laughs> she was perfectly positioned and she had the barracuda look in her eye. I feel so fortunate to say not only did I win, I won, I won the gold medal, but I won my first medal 
I've, I've gone on to medal since then, and so that one is even more, like every time I win a medal, that first one feels so much more special because it started something that I've been able to kind of rise to that level again. I, in my career, have not always gotten what I wanted. She missed Boulder, and she missed her training group, and... I don't think people realize how hurt she was. The Rio Olympics, it was not the perfect build-up. From 400 to go to 300 to go, you'd say, here she comes. 